So, coming back again to the conclusion of the Rasalila. <coughs> the Gopikas uh, at the end sing to um, Krishna, the Gopika Gita, and after that also he tests them. But just to know uh, what this whole thing is about, we will go back in a little while to the beginning itself. When he says, do you know who I am? He asks them. The Gopikas say, Gyanis and Bhaktas know you. We are bankrupt because we've renounced everything. We have neither jnana nor bhakti. So you can imagine they were the parama bhaktas without realizing it. When you say, I am a bhakta, then you are not a fully a bhakta because the I is there. But when you say, I have nothing, I'm a beggar, I've renounced everything, you give up the, at the end, you give up even your consciousness, you renounce even the upasana, and you even, that is why we start early in life learning to Krishna Arpanamastu, people say. That is, whatever you do, I don't want the fruits of it all. So this is for you. You know best where the fruits are to go. Supposing I'm doing a havan or a mantra for the sake of learning patience or for the sake of bhakti, I'm not saying give me bhakti. That is how I may start. But at the end of it, I'm saying, I've got you, I don't need anything else, and I renounce those fruits. So the Supreme will take your fruits, and he knows. We don't know who needs that bhakti in which it could be somebody who you might call a terrorist. We don't know. We only see with a limited mind. So the Divine knows where it has to go, and then he gives your bhakti to somebody who needs it completely. In that way, you become an instrument of the Divine. You don't look around for handouts from him. You just work and <clears throat> um, do what needs to be done. So, gopis ask him <clears throat> at the end. Um, they say, before that, they say, put your uh, hand on our head. What is the head? Is the Sahasra Chakra. That is, please come to us and let us be merged in you. Because these are rishis who have lived for millions of lifetimes in a sattvic manner. And the fruits of sattva is another good birth, another level of devotion. And which now they don't even want that. They just want to be his um, nimitta, the instrument and eventually even that goes because why if i've given myself to you why would i say here take me i've given it's your responsibility to take that sort of thing now <clears throat> when they say then put your feet on my chest on my breast on my bosom they are saying give me the first uh, venugana the first flute sound in the anahat chakra it does not mean your physical breasts or your physiological heart. It means the anaha chakra at that point, which is the point where having handled power and uh, prana in the Manipur chakra, the fire, you, the kundalini has risen to the anaha where true bhakti starts. I am yours, you are mine. That's all there is to it. So then you will find in many such pictures, you will find even there is a uh, Matangi's um, consort is Uchishta Ganapati, Uchishta Ganapati, and she is the consort. And, and in the Vigrahas, in the pictures and statues of Matangi, you will see a picture of Ganapati, he who represents the Omkar first, holding his hand under her breast near her. Heart. And sometimes people say, oh, this is tantric, it means something vulgar. No, tantra is one of the most beautiful, the most compassionate of 
sciences. What it means is he is telling you awaken the Shakti of Bhakti in the Anaha Chakra. That is what they mean when they are talking about it. There are many, many um, hidden meanings in many of these Puranas and um, the, uh, the Shastras in every religion. So <clears throat> it is said the root of salvation is Jnana. Jnana is the transcendental knowledge, not the limited knowledge we have. Why is Krishna eating? Eating, but uh, all this is just to for people who are not able to relate to that level. You keep this memory alive by saying, "See what a cute child." When you look at your baby that is born, and if your baby is a uh, little grown up and he takes butter or a candy from the candy can, climbing up over something to get it, so mama doesn't see it, then that is Krishna. In. So they they have used, the rishis have used every situation in life to point towards the spirit and not to the physical body. So where does jnana come from? Because we say the root of salvation is jnana, liberation. Jnana comes through Shiva. And here, when they say Shiva, they are not talking of the uh, particular form of the person with a moon, crescent moon on his head. These are all symbols. Shiva means that which is sacred, that which is auspicious, and that which is good, beneficial. Now, <clears throat> Shiva comes with what? With the mantra, Om Namah Shivaya. Namah Shivaya, these are the mantras of the five elements. I'll come to that in a little while. Now, <clears throat> the speech of the Guru is the root of mantra, they say. So, what is the Guru? The Guru Tattva. Guru has no qualities. You can't say he's so cute or he's so sweet and he's so rough, he's so loving. You can't say anything because all qualities are the divine qualities and these divine qualities flow through somebody to you to support you, maintain you, nourish you towards your final source, lifetime after lifetime. The sooner we recognize this, which also is his grace, then the sooner we will move towards him. For example, a child that gets a smack from the mother will cry, he might even tell the mother, I hate you, but the next time he wants something, he'll go running to the mother. That is how we are also. <clears throat> now, if you remember the um, uh, Saundarya Lahari, the first verse, <clears throat> Shiva Shakya Yukto Yadi Bhagati Shakta Prabhavitum Nache Devam Devanakarupushovaspandi Tumapi. That is, it is the Shiva Shakti Aikyam. They are together, they are not separate. Guru takes bodies for the transmission of jnana. So you will see, they will tell you that when you reach the Agnya Chakra and inside your mind, you will see two feet on your head. <clears throat> These two feet, one is white and one is red. The white is Shiva and the red is Shiva. That is consciousness and it's the transcendent consciousness and it's the inner potency. That is the the consciousness of the transcendental divine and his own Shakti. And these two are together always. The Aikyam is what they are talking about. Shiva Shaktya Yukto. Together they are. His body is what you call the Kundalini, the three and a half circles. That is the manifest form of the divine. He is Pranava, the Omkar, the first in all mantras. That the first Shabda Brahman, the first sound you hear. Therefore, all Japa, chanting, all Dhyana, meditation, all gifts, Dhana, Bet, all penance, Tapas, everything begins and ends with Om. Every mantra is hidden in Om. Pranava is speech. You know, when you say, oh, it is what you're speaking. 
but what are you spoke, speaking about? You are speaking about the Parabrahman or the Supreme Soul. Now both are the same. So both are one and the same. That is the Omkar or the Shabda, the sound which denotes the Supreme is the Supreme. This is the greatest reality, the greatest Tattva of the Guru Tattva. So <clears throat> what are these three and a half circles of Kundalini that we are talking about? It is the three Vedas. Rig, Yajur, Sama. The three gods, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, the creative force, the sustaining force, and the dissolving force of the manifest or immanent universe. The three gunas, Sattva, Rajas, Tamas. Jagrat, Swapna, Shushupti, that is the waking state, the dreaming state, and the deep sleep state. And these, all these three are called Agni, Soma, and Surya. That is fire, the moon, and the sun, the three eyes. So don't take it literally as the sun you are seeing in the sky. And uh, <clears throat> in Tantra, they have different meanings. They refer to the completion of different um, chakras. So <clears throat> this is who the Guru is in reality is and the guru patanjali will say is the um Purveshamapi. he was there before everything else came the first one the jagat guru and people call this jagat guru as krishna as shiva whichever your um uh, your way of relating to the divine is you can call that guru as allah as christ whichever way you want to see it because that is a help for you a pratyaya that's a content of your consciousness in meditation to lead you to have a complete focus ekagrata now <clears throat> when you then come to the Krishna Avatara itself, and we are talking through the Krishna Avatara is when a being completely brings the entire energy of the Parabrahman or the totality of the transcendental truth, he is called an incarnation. One who, please don't make noise, one. One who goes towards the highest and is susceptible to the ultimate and does not need to come again, but does. So here is we have to remember that um, Krishna and Lalita Devi, that is the father and the mother, they are one and the same. You, m me, my Dharmakirti talking is Dharmakirti. It's my energy of talking. Somebody there, Shreya, who is listening, the energy of Shreya helps her to listen. So this is the male and female energies within us. And that is why they say, yesterday I told you, Yoshitsu Lalita Devi Purusheshascha Raghavaha Tayoho Sammelanam Krishna Lavanyam. That is the most fascinating, most alluring, the most beautiful, incomparable beauty is Lalita, the mother, the Shakti. And the incomparable beauty among the male energies is Raghavaha. Raghava, that is Rama, who followed Dharma. And when both of them are melted together, you get the beauty of Krishna, Lavanya. So Krishna is both the father and the mother, the son, the daughter. You can see the divine in any way that you wish to see. And he or she, whichever way you um, relate to that um, ultimate, that energy will come to your help and um, move in to help you at every point in your life. And that is the... Um, that is the revelation of this morning to me. That 
when I say revelation, please don't think of something fancy like seeing a, a creature coming with wings and giving me an adesh and all, nothing like that. It is that I remember very strongly a single sentence that Swami Satyananda told me at one time, and that was, he said, even if the nearest and dearest betrays you, do not lose faith. So what is your nearest and your dearest? It's not somebody out there. It's your mind. And the mind can deceive you at every place. This mind, if, even if it dis deceives you, at some point, do not lose your faith. You are protected. You are helped. You will be taken care of. And that is the message I want to give everybody today, that we are all together in this journey. And no matter what happens, the Guru Tattva comes to us and takes care of us in the way we need, which our soul realizes. And in that way, we ask the divine for we remember the divine and whichever form you is very important to you, he comes to you in that form and he gives you the help. So do not make the form as permanent. It can come in any form. Everybody's form is, is the same essence, the rasa. So remember that and then we'll go on. <coughs> now, what is... Nama Shivaya, it refers to the um, elements that make up the physical body, the um, space, air, fire, water, earth. This is the elemental bodies that we are talking about. And what contains all this is the Omkar, the Pranava. Can you stop making that noise, please? Now, <clears throat> what is this Akasha? To start with, they say that there were pranic vibrations. These pranic vibrations brought out light and sound. And when the light comes first, the Swayam Prakasha, this is called in undifferentiated matter. It has not taken form, but it has an infinite amount of potential energy in consciousness. When this undifferentiated matter, it is not differentiated into different forms, but with its infinite potential energy, it starts vibrating. It can become anything. It can become a doll, it can become paddy, it can become garbage, it can become you, it can become your pet. Every form comes, the space given to that form to be itself is given by Akasha. And Akasha, the, or the space, is the um, inherent potency of the Lord that is called Bhuvaneshwari. Now, <clears throat> in this undifferentiated, this infinite potential starts vibrating that is called space. And in that space, that vibration brings about movement. And there is a complete freedom because space at that time is completely um, infinite. So all pervading. Because the movement is there, the vibration, that is that vibration is, uh, it is destabilizing to start with because it is trying to form matter it has not yet formed matter. Then this vibration, this is Vayu, or the air that we talk about. Then with that vibration and the movement, heat is generated. That heat helps, the dis helps to dispel the, um, the part of the radiative energy. So when that dispels, then the, it cools. So that is Agni, the fire. The fire can come in good or negative ways also. So when you say fire, we are not talking about just 
fire on the outside that you make with the matchstick. It's a fire that is present at the center of the earth. It is in the depth of the ocean. It is within your own body, the fire that makes your cells to be active, the digestive fire, the fire of aspiration that makes you move towards something higher and more with the truth in yourself. So <clears throat> on the same uh, way, any argument, any accident, any environmental catastrophe is also agree. And everything comes with a blessing, something that we need to learn. So when that Agni happens, when the, it is now starting to be confined in a definite space. So when it, the space is definite, the different forms, I am not cosmic as I know myself. So when my consciousness becomes cosmic, my form goes because I spread everywhere. And the same thing for you. I'm just saying it in a way to understand. When you're when you are everywhere, the cosmic self and you con concrete, become concrete and um, tied to a form, that is, it is confined in a definite space. There is a reduction in the vibration. This is called apas of water, the waters of creativity. This has benefits, but it's not permanent because no form is permanent forever then each particle within its own space, each particle within its own space has a material benefit. It gives stability or permanence, temporary. That is what we call matter and matter or prithvi. So these are the five elements, space. See these as the vibrations of the highest um, Mahaprana or the highest transcendental matter condensing itself right to light, sound. So, and when you see Krishna wearing yellow uh, robes, that is a reference to the uh, aspect that he is full of light. The Omkar, he says, among the Aksharas, I am Om in the Bhagavad Gita. It is Om that signifies that there is a certain specific vibration that is responsible for the manifest, his manifestation as the universe. And when you see the form of the earth, you want to say at the lowest point where it, the form comes, form is seen. Not that it is not there, it is potential, but now it is actualized. This is what we call the Shakti. And according to the inherent potency that is brought about, they are given different names, like the Buddhi or the tra transcendent discrimination between permanent and real is called Dukkha. The Ahla, the Shakti, or the bliss that comes with everything being joined together, that is called Radha. So depending upon which vibration you tune into, that vibration becomes part of your whole Nama Shivaya, all your elements in your body, then it becomes part of your mind, and then it becomes part of your soul. And when it uh, saturates your whole body, and that is why Nama Smaranam, or saying the word, the mantra, or the name of the divine is said to be so powerful because it is not just a word, it is not just letters as we see it. These are specific cosmic vibrations and each vibration gives you a specific uh, quality. And the more you repeat that vibration and not just repeat mechanically, the more you contemplate on it, meditate on it, understand its meaning at different, different times in your life, different, different layers of consciousness. It goes deeper and deeper and it pulls out all the old karmas and samskaras and it lets it go. And that is the kripa of the guru, the guru tattva, which is also the omkar. <coughs> 
And this is why Krishna will say to Arjuna, there was never a time when I did not exist. Meaning, he was there in an invisible form, the transcendent form. Then when he decided to manifest, he becomes the Shabda Brahman, the first vibration of sound Omkar. And then he becomes the elements and then the elements become concentrated into the grossest part, which is the matter, the form in which every creation is um, part of. So <clears throat> this, uh, that is why he is called the pervader. Vishnu means he who pervades everything, the omnipresent. His special manifestation is the go, go means pranava, come to earth. So the words go, go pi, go pa, Krishna, they all refer to the cosmic glory in manifestation, that is the eighth. <clears throat> Why the eighth? Because you have seven chakras and as the kundalini or the shakti or the power, the energy of the transcendent arises from the muladhar chakra, not just yours in the whole universe. The slowly when you have finished, when the full flower has blossomed in the anahat, the uh, fear of being extinguished is gone. It goes to the next chakra, this uh, energy, Swadishtana. When it goes to the next chakra, the earlier chakra is dissolved. It's like when you say, when I've got up, my sleep is dissolved. You're not sleeping and waking at the same time. It's like that. So each chakra that the um, shakti or the potential is becoming actualized. The power becomes actualized when it moves from one chakra to the other. The chakra that it ascended from, that is a lower chakra, is dissolved in the ultimate state. And that is why they say the seven chakras are, are dissolved to for the kundalini or the force of the mother within any creation to become the eighth. The eighth is ashtan, that is the eighth. And um, you will find that ashtami. Why do we say tomorrow will be Gokula ashtami? This is the eighth one. This is the day he came to be born. The seventh was his Maya Shakti, Yoga Maya. She is born Vishnu Maya. His power first comes and then he comes. Remember this. So she is called the Lokamata. She can bewilder you with her illusions and she can also, after you learn from the illusory nature, take you to the ultimate Krishna or Lalita Devi. So <clears throat> here you find the Ashtan means to pervade the omnipresent, to master, he is the Ishvara, controller, to enjoy and to experience. This all these phases of the omnipresence in the manifestation did not come at a certain time. It is here and now. What prevents us from seeing this thing within us is because the us is an identity of this physical body. When I look at this physical body in the mirror, I tell myself, this is me, this is Dharma Kirti. If I'm in a hospital, I would say, this is me, I'm a doctor. If I were in an ashram, this is me, I'm a disciple. So these are the identities I give myself so that I can function in a specific way but they are not my ultimate uh, identity. The ultimate identity is the Shakti of the divinity in every person. This is the Lokamata or the Divine Mother within you. And that is what the entire um, Rasa Leela is leading you to. The whole Rasa Leela is based eventually on the mantra Om and Preem. Om is the manifestation starting and Preem is the mantra of the Lokamata who as space gives you the opportunity to become a form. So you have the energy of the 
manifest force of life and creation in the Muladhar and Swadishta. It is a creative force of Brahma, the urge to procreate, the deep instinctive knowledge, the desire for survival. All this is called the Brahma Granthi. Now that you have achieved it, there is no need to stay at that point. This is called the Dumralingam. The symbol of that is the smoky colored lingam. Then you come to the Manipur, Anahat, and the Vishuddhi chakras, which talk about the psychic dimension of the sustenance of body and mind. All your koshas in, are involved in this Anandamaya, Pranamaya, Manomaya, Vijnanamaya, Anandamaya. So the food here is prana. You don't need to eat bread and butter to survive. It is the prana in the bread and butter. You can't eat a decayed bread because there's no prana to it. So the food is the prana and matter is the energy there. The anahat sustains the mental body that we find which is raw, which is unrefined, which has intense emotion. Now this intense emotion is transformed into bhakti. And but with Vishuddhi, what happens there? It sustains and helps in the final merger of the spiritual forces. Then you go to Agnya. What does Agnya do? Agnya comes next. These three together, Manipur, Anahat, and Vishuddhi, constitute the Vishnu Granthi. It, it vitalizes, feeds, nurtures, and balances all. Uh, dimensions and it begins to draw prana from the uh, universe itself that is why some people can fast for you uh, some years ago i remember seeing a jain muni who uh, did not eat anything for a number of days in a year what happens when you reach that point you move into the capacity to draw prana from the universe and not your own individual prana. This is called Mahaprana. And it that part of it is at its highest at the Anahat Chakra, when intensity of emotion, intensity of power, all that is transformed into Bhakti. This is sometimes shown as a red lingam or what is called a Bana lingam, that which has come by itself what uh, we get from the river Narmada. Then you go to the Agnya and Sahasra. Now you have the energy of the force of dissolving. Dissolving of what? Dissolving of your ahamka. Your sense of saying, I am this, I am that. This body is me. This mind is me. This psyche is me. And you start opening out to seeing that you're part of, part of the whole. This ahamkar gives you the omniscience, the final way of looking at the <clears throat> merger of yourself uh, into the highest level. This is what is called the beginning of um, the Vishwarupa Darshan, where you get that feeling. And this is called, at this point, the symbol is the Itarakya Lingam at the Agnya Chakra, which is black. These are three bondages that we have to go beyond. <clears throat> when these three granthis or bonds are cut, we realize what we call as Krishna. And <clears throat> when we practice the uh, practice of Trataka in yoga, Please remember, we are not looking at the candlelight or at the um, vigraha, that is the statue that you call God. We are relating to that divinity in the uh, vigraha or in a yantra and making it part of who we are. And that is called the avatara of the archa, archa avatara. He comes in a form that you can worship. It is the same form that is within you that is hidden. So you have the outer trataka or bahya drishti 
in which you relate to the external form that you call God. That is the support of your consciousness, Pratyaya. Then the Bahya Antar Drishti, outer and inner combined, which you do in Trataka, is remembering and slowly by contemplating, realizing that whatever you see outside is within you. If somebody is angry with you, always remember there was an anger inside you waiting to be provoked and manifest and left. It is not the other person shouting at you. The other person is a catalyst to help you bring out a suppressed anger or a grief or a love. This is Bahya Antar Drishti. Then you have only the inner gaze in the Antar Drishti, where you are looking again at that same um, Pratyaya, at that same symbol within yourself, as real as you can see any other person talking to you. And this is called the Antar Drishti or the inner gazing. Then you start going into what is called the Shunya Drishti, gazing into the emptiness. This is where the Gopikas are, first they look at him, their eyes are focused on him, that is the Bahya Drishti. Then you start feeling happy looking at your Ishta Devata. That is the Bahya Antar Drishti. Then when you look at the divine or you look at somebody you love or you look at something you love you feel a delight coming up within you that is bahar and antar drishti then even in memory you can summon up that person's form and his relationship with you or her relationship with you or its relationship with you say you are uh, crazy about a cricket match the word kri itself will make you salivate so that's what I'm talking about. It becomes an inner gazing. You don't have to, inner gazing, you don't have to be in the physical presence of what or who or that you love. That being has already integrated within you. Then you have the Shunya Drishti because you are following this inner delight and knowing that this is this form that gives you that pleasure. Then the form goes away. And suddenly you feel bankrupt. Where was it? Where is it? Have I lost it? Has that being rejected me? So this is the Shunya that we are looking into, the dark night of the soul. There is nothing that you can see that is supportive. You're bankrupt. But all that means is that your consciousness or your identity is going and that Supreme has taken the place of your identity so you don't recognize the supreme because you have never related to it you only have your emotion and your sentiment now you start relating to it and suddenly you feel like you like a person who is a good a person who can walk well with a map on the uh, in new york suddenly that person finds himself thrown into space and you have to navigate in space you didn't you don't have the faith confidence in you because you have not navigated here before so then you suddenly get the sense of looking at the void and say oh my god where have i landed then you will come to the fifth phase of the nirantara drishti you will find a continuous gazing at that inner light which is you so this is what they are talking about in the whole thing when the gopikas see krishna and then we coming to the, I'm going to tell you a few little stories to give you the uh, form of the, to make you understand the tattva that we are talking about, Krishna tattva. We often hear of him as a, um, uh, as stealing. He is the, this is called the steya yoga. We are told to practice asteya integrity don't try to grab which is not yours when you use too many electronic um, objects for example it is polluting the air around you which means you are stealing the air that was meant for someone else who did not uh, need 
these things. But in the name of development and greed for bettering and bettering ourselves for greed, for power, we steal, we all steal. So to get back to the spiritual path, they are talking, they are talking about asteyam in yoga. That is why a person who practices yoga is not practicing the asana and pranayama and pratyahara. That person is practicing to be a beggar, not take more than what comes to you. The only person who has um, who has uh, become um, proficient or who has the skill to handle steya yoga, steya, steya means becoming a thief, is the Supreme Self, and here we call him Krishna. So you will find Saint John of the Cross. <clears throat> he, when he goes through that dark night of the soul, he says, why after stealing it, hast thou thus abandoned it and not carried away what you have stolen? He's talking of the heart, the thing that you love so much, the which made you renounce everything else and reach that point. And then you feel as if you have been abandoned. That is the ultimate feeling of the Gopika. St. John of the Cross was a Gopa. But it is not the ultimate truth. You have to go through that and understand that nothing else can be your refuge other than the divine. And that is what Swamiji means. Put that in your subtle body that even if the nearest and dearest betrays you, do not lose your faith. He is talking to a sukshma sharira. And when a guru says a statement, it's, it is a very subtle diksha. We don't understand it. We just take it as a sentence. Swamiji said this, Swamiji said that. Swamiji or your authentic guru, when he says you will become successful in this, go ahead. It means he is saying, I have taken the responsibility. I am doing the work. And you are to only understand Naham Karta, Guru Karta, Guru Karta, Kevalam. So, <clears throat> this Krishna or this Gurutvam or this uh, divinity, the mother, within you, that Krishna says, there never was a time when I did not exist. So you don't see Krishna as a historical personality and a localized happening. That is an insult to the emotion, to the um, immortal eternity of Krishna or the Supreme Force or Allah or Christ. They exist everywhere. They are for all creations. That divinity exists, is omnipresent within every creation in your table. You don't have to be a Hindu to respect, to worship Allah. You don't have a Mus to be a Muslim to worship Krishna. They are all the same supreme force that we are talking about, the Divine Mother. And is this this divinity that the Gopikas attain towards the end? And why, why do they say that? Krishna is Navanitam. Navanitam means always new. He's always a fresh butter that you go on churning the cosmic matrix. You are, you and I, we are the cosmic matrix with form. You churn it and churn it and churn it. And the um, fresh butter is, harm, is warmed by cosmic love and compassion. That presence is experienced at the limits of infinity of created space. That created space in that, so you see that divinity everywhere. Anybody tells you anything, they are coming fresh, new. It is not part of yesterday. So you have somebody whom, who has been mean to you yesterday. Today, when, you, when they come near you, don't be afraid because it could be God coming in another form. That person might give you a smile. Don't reject it because you become stiff and rigid. This is the first part of being fearless in the presence of God because you see the divine everywhere. This is called the Brahma Shariram. Now, when your consciousness is illumined by the experience of the presence, 
when you start understanding oh so this is it this is called gritam gritam means the illumined so this is the reason we offer melted butter into a blazing altar that is when you attain this awareness you give that also to the divine with love and the divine receives it with love and says now you are my instrument i you have become a little like you have some of the qualities of mine because you have been meditating on me all the time so this is the meaning of his stealing the butter only he can do it so you can't go steal anything from somebody's thing and pretend to be what you are not which means that if you say aham brahmasmi and i have not experienced that quality i am being um i don't have integrity if i don't have integrity then i have to practice asteyam till i get integrity then i go closer and closer to my own inner self now the <clears throat> next the uh, story i want you to understand through these stories who we are talking about who is this krishna so the next thing they say is krishna tied to the mortar mother gets annoyed with him because he is stealing butter the story is and then she uh, uh, is feeding him to start with and then she has kept milk on the stove the milk over boils and um, she he comes uh, he gets very angry he knocks over the pots and then she comes there and she again takes him to feed and then he is annoyed because here he is the divinity and that is a lesson for all of us the divinity is always with us and we make karma yoga into a habit or a technique we say when i go i miss the ashram and going there and doing karma yoga karma yoga is not what you do in the ashram karma yoga is any work that you, that comes to you whatever you have to do in life boiling the milk churning the butter taking your son to the school bus putting him on it whatever has come to you through your karma and what is necessary in this world where the mind and senses are concerned the buddhi or the higher mind must constantly have one goal only and that goal is service to the lord that is why sometimes swami ji or the guru would always tell you that you have your mantra you make 108 times you do it on your <coughs> mala you call it a technique but and you might continue living with that technique for the end of your life and then come back again to understand what you were actually doing what you were doing was putting this vibration into yourself a vibration that he that guru tatva in your guru has recognized as part of your particular vibration and you go on becoming saturated with it, that vibration and when that vibration becomes more and more saturated and you see the divinity within you as the divinity in every other being then you reach out and you help that other person with great love and compassion without looking for adulation or validation don't look for the government to come and recognize you don't look for god to say good for you you done so much sometimes we hear people say you feed your uh, the other man's child and god will feed your child it may be a fact but you don't do it because you will get something in return that is why jesus says cast your bread upon the waters and it will come back to you thousand fold now he says the word and it will come he doesn't say because it will come back to you so you don't have a deal with god you give you simply give you have love in your heart give it you have something material give it you have a smile give it and go on the other person might make a, a grumpy face that is not your business that is the fruits of his karma you give and give then that is what swami shivananda also is saying give of yourself the, the, the if you go to a temple and then you 
donate three uh, tube lights in the Garbhagriha. And then you say, donated by uh, Swami Dharma Kirti and friends and um, unlimited number of um, Guru Guru Bhaiyas and <clears throat> Guru Mitras and all that, then what are you doing here? That writing removes half the light on the tube light, on the tube light. So just give something and then don't, don't you don't even, Jesus will say, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. In other words, give and you forget that you have given. Don't think about I've given this thing to somebody and see what they are doing to me. It is not necessary. So this is what the Gopikas learned from Krishna, that <clears throat> everything belonged to everyone. He was, they were saying, don't say this is my butter. Take your, break your pot. Take the, he broke their pots. He took the butter. You go and sell some of the butter. Make your livelihood. But keep remembering that you're doing this as a um, as a service to the divine and your karmas of your small identities go and sooner and sooner <clears throat> the gopikas are growing from being young girls in love with their, um, the beautiful resplendent person who comes every day looking new with a different dress a different peacock feather and eventually they realize he is the one within them that just the memory gives them the um, pleasure of the delight of remembering him. This is your true Trataka. Now, <clears throat> the, um, whenever we take something from, say, for example, a tree, we go and buy, pick a fruit, the mango fruit, we say, that tree has lovely fruits. We never see that the um, Leaves are also part of it. We never uh, thank the leaves for being there to bring the oxygen, the solar energy into the tree. We don't say thank you to the malis, the malis, the gardeners. They don't pour water on the leaves because they don't recognize that the when you remove the dust on the leaves, it allows the tree to breathe better. And that is why you see that after a rain, they start blowing. So Yashoda left Krishna and ran to take the milk that overflowed from the stuff that she had kept in. And we all do this. Something happens, you stop looking at your child and you run to do the, you say, I'm doing so much karma yoga, I have to do karma yoga. You are not do, doing it mind, mindfully. If you do it mindfully, at that time you will realize is that milk important at this point or is it the despair of somebody else at this point that matters. So <clears throat> he taught her unconditional love there, Vatsalya. Yashoda left Krishna, she went to remove it and he was angry as a kid, he broke her pot. That is at the height of Karma Yoga, we get attached to the actions. And this is why Swamiji often puts you in one particular discipline. You might be in the printing press and then you get uh, good in the printing pre press. By the time you start patting yourself on the back, you will be cooking, cutting vegetables in the garden, in the kitchen. So we get attached to routines and we forget why we are acting. So she, when she ran to remove it, he um, got annoyed. He broke the pot of curds, her identity. Remember, we can get attached to anything, to the puja, to the ritual, to the meditation, and forget what we are doing it for. So he went inside, stole the curds, and ate it. Now, what he does by breaking the pots is breaking her identity and giving her a larger identity. He steals her chitta. Not even the vessel is left. This is meditation. Not even the vessel is left. Only he is there. So then he sees her with a stick and he runs and she follows. You know, <clears throat> they say even the yogis and jnanis, with all their penance and thing for lifetimes, they could not reach him. 
but she caught him and threatened him. And he cried, rubbing his eyes, uh, eyes putting all the eye text, what you call the eyeliner or the, the low, the traditional my that we say all over his eyes, all over his face, because he will come to you in the form that you want him to come to at any particular place. This mother wanted to um, scare him because she saw him as an ordinary child at that point to scare him so that he won't be naughty. So now he, he knows that she needs to increase her vatsalya or a motherly love at this point in her journey. He needs to act like a frightened child because she is st standing with a stick and the and threatening to tie him up. <clears throat> so now he is a child. He takes on when an incarnation comes to the world. He takes on the qualities of the incarnation that he is. So he has come as a little child. He has never felt fear in his supreme um, aspect. <clears throat> so he invokes the goddess of fear, that Shakti. And the goddess of fear is scared. Why is the Supreme calling me here to come and stand? So she comes trembling and with tears in her eyes and she's shivering and looking scared. So he looks at her face and says, oh, so this is how I have to act. So he takes that Shakti from her, puts it on and then brings himself to look like a trembling child who is afraid of the mother. So immediately she hugs him and she um, she realizes how much she uh, love, loves him truly and that way he helps her to increase the vatsalya. The mother in any creation, it can be a dog, it can be a lion, it can be a pine tree, it can be a man, it can be a woman, it doesn't depend upon the physical or your elemental body. The highest form of the woman, the womanly qualities is the mother. And that is why the Lokamata is worshipped everywhere. The Virgin Mary becomes the mother who protects. So now <clears throat> there is um, she wanted to tie him up at a particular time. But now how do you tie the omnipresent? He's neither in nor the universe itself. He's everything. But he allows himself to be tied up when he sees her struggling to tie him up, the mother, but smiling. She is not cribbing or demanding or whining. She, she herself sees it like a one just trying to tie him and she is not if the rope doesn't go around. So because she smiles, Krishna allowed himself to be bound. There were two people who were able to bind him. In, in Gokula, one was the Gopikas and the other was uh, Yashoda and the Gopikas. And secondly, Sahadeva, one of the Pandavas. Sahadeva bound him with Jnana. Yashoda and the Gopikas bound him with Bhakti. Yashoda more with Karma Yoga, Karma, Bhakti and Jnana. He allowed himself to be bound. And then the um, he goes around eating mud and the um, he his uh, brother complains to his mother that he is eating mud. He was just a toddler at that time. So she goes to him and she says, now why did you eat the mud? And he says, I didn't eat mud, he says, because to him it was in mud. You look at children, even now they can, when they are toddling, they can um, eat a brick, they can uh, scrape something off the wall and eat it, the doctors will tell you it's a calcium deficiency. It might be, but the child's mind never never thinks of it in more complicated terms. It just wants it. It's a, I didn't, he says. Then she says, of course you did. Your brother is saying that you did it. And he's saying, and he says, no, he must have bluffed to you. Look at my mouth, he says. And remember, in every situation in life, in every difficulty, in every distress, the Lord is constantly telling you, look, look, look at my mouth. 
look at where I am, but we don't look. We, and so she did the same. She said, okay, open your mouth, let me see. And when she looked at his mouth, she saw that he, the entire universe was within him, including herself and him and her standing there. And she realized at that point, this is the Mahatattvam. She realized it that, um, that he was the um, supreme soul, the supreme being, the Paramatma masquerading as a child. Now, <clears throat> she saw time because these were the gunas were disturbed and she saw what happened yesterday. The cause of birth, the seed of karma. She saw Krishna with his mouth open inside the mouth. And she had this revelation, but because of her sukshma mouth, uh, mind, sorry, sukshma mind, she was asking herself, is this a delusion? Is this a psychic vision or is it a real revelation? And then she reminds herself, the Lord alone is my refuge. Now that her debating within herself at that point of something being revealed to her, instead of saying, wow, she sees all that, there is a wow in her, but she's questioning herself, is this the reality? This, this means the buddhi or the viveka, the discriminative power is here being exercised, which shows that it was a revelation. It was not the mind. Then she says, she realizes this is his maya and he alone, the Lord, is my refuge. Then Krishna, as Vaishnavi Shakti, brings his inner potency of illusion and casts it on her, on the mother, so that she forgets all that she has seen and she once more thinks of him as a child, as just another child. And she had what is called Putra Snehu. That is the love of a child, mother for a child. So Parikshit asks at this point, he asks the uh, guru, he says, how come Yashoda got this chance to live, uh, to enjoy the pastimes of the divine as a child, which his own biological mother, Devaki, did not have? What is it that she did to get it? So, Sri Shukha Brahman says, when the creative force asked all the demigods, the Adityas, the Vasus, all to be born on earth in the Vrindavan, Rajabhumi, the foremost among the Vasus were a person called Drona and his wife Dara. They begged that when we are born on earth, we'll come, we'll be born as in any form you want us, but let the Highest devotion for Sri Hari appear in it, appear in us. So Brahma says, Tatastu. So th this Tattva says, what you ask, you get. Your Viveka should be so sharp that you ask for the right boon. Even and especially when your mind, which calculates, mind calculates, remember, that's why it can deceive. Now, even your mind is not there in that higher state. Because when you are in love, you are not thinking. Even then, your viveka should be so sharp that you should ask for what you really need and not for something trivial. So <clears throat> there's much more here. And then we are coming to the gopikas. Krishna says, okay. And then he, um, the Rasalila begins. You can put on the Rasalila. Maharas, it's called. Yes, Swamiji. And remember the Maharas, I'll keep talking till you put it on. The Maharas is the dormant Kundalini or the, the power within you, the infinite grace, divine grace descending on her. She offers up to the Lord the Prithvi where she sleeps in the earth, that is the Muladhar Chakra, and the Sukshma Sharira smell is that of the sandalwood. That is why we put sandalwood on our foreheads, we offer to visitors, we smear the divinity or make Abhishekam with the 
sandalwood paste and water and in um, this is why that bit we are saying we are giving up and the power within this body can ascend the cosmic power when you are a beggar and when you ascend when kundalini ascends the divine says wait for me and this is what krishna says this is what life tells us even if you are done your best wait for me it is i who decide the time and not you so can we have this maharas maharas we have understood what the maharas is all about <clears throat> according to the vedic rishis the desire to give himself away in creation and the desire to receive back creation in, into himself is the bond between the created and the creator according to the vedic seers love is an outflowing of divine delight it is a force and not an emotion the emotion is a shadow of that force divine desire comes as a vibration concentrated to a point bindu becoming three bindus the womb of creation the supreme mother manifesting threefold is called the pura sundari her for her outer worship is the full moon the inner worship is sahasra the seat of the mystic moon on the top of your head which is the place of your illumined mind and uh, that place where she stays is called the sudha sindhu the um, ocean of uh, beauty the ocean of milk that you call and she is the rasa of all existence rasa leela is the shiva shakti union that is the form when the form becomes merged with the formless the bhakta or the devotee becomes the mother and merges into the mother and the mother merges with the um, its own source so <clears throat> um yeah she is the 16 letter one the shodashi a transcendental aspect shodashi is krishna because in my male form says lalita in in one of the shastras in my male form i um <clears throat> come as krishna and fascinate the gopikas so she is the female form of krishna she is the seed that comes into our body to feel the rasa and the rasa is called the hrim hrim sharirini you see it in the trishati as you go back home to your own source the rasa is the highest state it happens to every person at some time because that krishna is not out there it is every moment it is um that force of that krishna or the divinity keeps on coming uh, showing himself every minute every moment and with the mantra hrim we reach the fertile soil this is your divine mother hrim kara and the <coughs> the rasa are the same it is no there is no physical contact they will tell you the physical body of the gopikas is in vrindavan it is their sukshma sharira that has no gender that meets krishna or the supreme so this is what we have to move towards uh, and krishna says to uddhava later that the out of the senses that see the world outside the experiences are called manomaya because born of the mind and therefore it stands yet that is today you might like a sari tomorrow you might like ice cream day after tomorrow it might be a game the day after that it may be a person whatever happens with the mind is also transient when the mind runs in pursuit of material objects which are transient 
to feed the senses, a delusion comes up. From this delusion is born the contamination of the gunas. And because of this, we get further and further entangled into the um, samsara, because we think this is it. So vasanas have to be removed again and again, again and again by one, our own effort. First the senses and the minds are brought under control. And this is where Viveka is very, very important. When your mind is illumined and the senses are aroused, it is because not because of some other power, it is grace. So it is not the mind and senses by themselves. So <clears throat> the story is <clears throat> the soul of the <clears throat> my the soul of the samsara sakara. What we say, this life, this material life, is all actually the a way of going to the divine through. Um, happiness and sadness and whatever you go through distress or uh, things that are good you um, you take it with equanimity because this is a game played by the mother so that you learn she's still showing you a stick and saying i'll tie you to the mortar yashoda is in every being so the gopis ask Krishna finally, some love those who love them. Some love even those who do not love them. Others do not love anyone at all except God. And they don't care if they are loved or unloved by others. Please explain this to us. So Krishna says, those who love those who love them, they are selfish, they do marketing because love becomes useful. Sometimes there is no dharma in the behavior also. Karna loved Duryodhana because Duryodhana uh, gave him the validation that he needed at a point when he was the most demoralized. So he joined with Duryodhana and even excused his uh, shortcomings and um, furthered them because in a very subtle way, it was useful, useful for him to feel that he was the right person. His identity was with his body and his mind, even though he had so much of generosity in him. So one has to be always alert. The second thing is like parents for the children. You love even those who do not love them. That is the way parents love, Vatsalya. The third one where the sages or the dullards, what look like dullards or, you know, sages, both can only take and never give. But the sages have a different way. The dull person can take but doesn't have the capacity to give. The fourth type, however, is that the all desire is satisfied in the divine alone. They are called Atma Ramas. Then, they tell themselves, I don't belong to any of these. I love everyone because um, Krishna is telling the gopis also, gopikas, I don't belong to anybody. Don't try to make me your belonging. Don't try to trap me. I love everyone impartially. I remain invisible so that you experience this. Visesha yoga, this very spectacular yoga of anguish in suffering. And he says to them, I cannot repay you even in one heavenly year by your blemishless love and renunciation. So they say that Krishna was born in a prison and he later was again in the prison of the Gopika's hearts, saying, I will never leave Vrindavan because of this debt. So Rasa Leela is a saturation of Advaita. It is not a, again, they will tell you again and again, it is not a physical relationship between a man and a woman. It has nothing to do with genders. So um, when you are utterly, truly bankrupt, when you realize that nothing belongs to you, 
even as you go along all dimensions are given up siddhis are given up even his form is given up at one stage happened to ram krishna paramahamsa he alone is the shore where the soul is utterly and bitterly bankrupt then the lord comes so ram krishna says people sob on the loss of a wife or son does anybody shed one tear for god darshan so he says i used to weep to kali even one day if she didn't come to me so it is in this context that krishna says i will never leave you priyam that's it you can put these other pictures with the instrument shivani shivani yes swami ji yeah All right just a minute Yeah, and remember always try to be a Gopika or try to be a Shoda. Everybody has these qualities within themselves. They just don't realize it. Not they. I too. I'm talking. When I say they and you, I'm talking to myself also, because our mind is oscillating. We don't have the steadiness to hold on to it. identity comes and goes the ego comes and goes but that's the whole leela of it all so i'll just make your heart into vrindavan it's not out to there and find your own inner krishna the feet of the supreme soul place it in the lotus of your heart and learn to be a gopika or a yashoda along the way there will be storms there will be difficulties but the guru will always come and lead you across these difficulties have faith even if the nearest and dearest to you betray you never let go of faith are you that's it. 